Hello and welcome to this episode of Creative Concepts. I'm David Prosser, Literary and Editorial Director of the Stratford Festival, and we're here to explore some aspects of our 2015 production of Hamlet, the film of which you can watch on Stratfest at home free of charge. The production was directed by our festival's artistic director, Anthony Cimolino, who's here with me now. Welcome. Hi, David. Uh, uh, hi, Anthony. And my other guest is the production's composer, who is none other than Canadian popular music icon Stephen Page. Stephen, of course, rose to fame with his band Bare Naked Ladies and has since been pursuing an array of solo creative projects uh, in music and film, in theatre and television. And if I've counted it right, he's written scores for six Stratford Festival productions, beginning with Anthony's own As You Like It in 2005. So thank you both for taking the, uh, the time to share your thoughts on Hamlet with us. Could I begin um, by asking you, Anthony, uh, about generally about the role of music in Shakespeare's plays? Because we don't usually think of music in terms of what we call straight plays, non-musicals. But I, I'd, I'd like to hear what your thoughts about what the, the, the importance of music is in those plays, and, and particularly, of course, uh, here at the festival. Well, um, music can figure quite prominently when Stephen and I first started to work together on As You Like It. I mean, that has more songs than any other of Shakespeare's plays. And uh, and so I was so lucky that he agreed to do that crazy thing because he was he's so busy and to unplug and to dedicate himself to writing the music for a play was huge. And we had a whale of a time. It was it was huge fun. Um, but music in a play uh, can be something that connects scenes. It can be in background uh, music to, to give us a sense of the general tone, or it can be for songs. And the songs can be deceptive. Like as Stephen and I were working on As You Like It, we kept finding that the songs were almost counterpuntal. What was being said in the songs was actually opposite to what the action was. To, it had a kind of ironic quality to it. So what should that sound like? Should it give in to the presiding mood of the of scene, or should it actually do what the words are doing, which is undercut? It. So there's a lot of things to think about as, as you're working on these plays and doing music. Hmm. So, so S Stephen, can you think back to to that first experience? How you first became involved in in writing music? First, did Anthony reach out to you, or did you show up and say, "I want to write for the Stratford stage"? I had it had not crossed my mind. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm a um, a huge fan of theater and uh, and of the festival, but I hadn't really considered how I could contribute and be a part of it. And Anthony called me up and said that he was planning on um, presenting As You Like It as set in the Summer of Love, 1967. And um, wanted to kind of have a rock and roll soundtrack um, and they, you know, told me there were a significant number of songs in the text, and would this be something I'd be I'd consider doing? Um, which I, I jumped at the chance, and it really completely changed my perspective on writing music. You know, first of all, I'm not used to writing music for other people's lyrics, um, and second of all. I got just about the best lyricist of all time, so it made my job kind of easy to do that by setting these these uh, songs to music. I'm just curious about the process of writing a song. I mean, do you is it do you start? I mean, how do you do it? Do you think of notes in your head? Do you start actually writing stuff down on paper? Can you just explain that to someone who is completely ignorant about it? Well, traditionally, I was not a pen and paper kind of writer. I, I did grow up you know, singing in choir, so I had some sight singing skills and so on, but I wasn't uh, I wasn't as adept as I would have liked to have been at, at reading and writing music, um, which for me was a, a point of some kind of shame and, and, and lack of, I, it certainly um, triggered my sense of, uh, 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 my lack of confidence. Um, but what I did have was a knack for I always have had as you know a knack for melody and a knack for setting like a sense of what uh what sonically what instruments what palette i can use in order to evoke a time a place a mood um and those things are what the music 
in theater is for. Um, so what I would start doing, quite often what I what I would what I'll do when working with Shakespeare plays is I will look at the text quite often, even in plays you don't imagine, like Hamlet, for example. Uh, there are songs in the text, um, sung by whether it's the grave digger or uh, Ophelia or um, you know they, these things show up. And they kind of pass you by in the audience because it's just an actor singing this without accompaniment necessarily. It sounds off the cuff. But if I can use those songs as jumping off points, a place for the, um, the especially, you know, in, in Shakespeare, those I ams really do um, lead you or lead me at least to a sense of melody. And those melodies become the motifs I end up using throughout the course of the play. Anthony, as I remember it, when you were actually starting rehearsals for, for that production back in, in 2015, you, you said something about seeing this play as taking place in a world that was divided between the past with all of its kind of old codes and traditions and the modern age, uh, with the First World War as the kind of watershed. Give me some light. Well, Shakespeare, because he was uh, writing and, you know, between 1590 and 1616, 1610, um, was really at the beginning of the modern world. Like he, um, he, he often writes about old codes, old ways of behavior and changes that happen as the world of modern banking and the new world was opening up. Um, but this play especially seems to be about young people and young energy. And it's a tragedy because you have an extraordinary, sensitive, intelligent young prince with the power to change the world for the better. And he comes up against the corruption of the world in all sorts of different ways. And so um, it felt to me like the, the starting with the First World War, beginning at a time when the old world was really going away and we were moving into um, uh, a, a, a century that was about uh, an informality, a modernity um, that should take us to a better place, and it doesn't. The, the corruption stays, and the young people aren't able to change it. And so um, one of the great things we're working with Stephen Page is that he really is a musicologist in addition to, you know, uh, being a performer. Like, he, what he taught me about the early birth of disco in Europe in, uh, when we were working on As You Like It was amazing. And he listens to everything and he's got a great brain on him. And, uh, and so it was wonderful to talk through what we might incorporate then for musical in influences in this world of the early 20th century. In the process, which is early on, you know, um, Anthony will come to me with his notes and his thoughts about this production and what he wants to achieve and where he wants it to go. So, for example, in, in Hamlet, we talked about the that point in history in the early 20th century um, and that this was going to stay in Denmark. We weren't going to move it somewhere else. Well, it was a, a really rich uh, time for me to be able to dig into, time and place. Um, and it doesn't mean that everything had to be period correct with the music, but it was a great place for me to start investigating. And some of the things that I ended up digging into were, okay, what was happening in music at that point? Well, you know, this is the end of the romantic period um, for the old guard, let's say. But, um, in Denmark, probably Denmark's greatest known uh, composer was Nielsen, um, writing beautiful string quartets. Uh, but with an element of uh, Scandinavian folk in it as well. There's this, that, so that, that was like a place for me to start. And you'll hear that right off the top of the show with um, this uh, string quartet. <laughs> Then I wanted to be able to look at what was happening technologically in the in the first 20 years of the 20th century. Um, in Europe, we see the beginnings of things like the invention of the vacuum tube, the beginning of the most rudimentary what we now see as synthesizers, but they would have been organs and that kind of thing at that time. So they became 
a place if I try to be very strict in my thinking. Nobody else in the audience has to know that I'm that I'm being this this hard, this strict with myself. But to be able to give myself these rules and say okay anything with the with the younger people especially in the second half of the show can get more noisy more discordant let's bring back the motifs we introduced in the first two acts and have them have a different meaning which is just the same thing that happens in the text you know anthony was talking earlier about even in as you like it about how there's a sense of irony in the lyric but in uh in uh, Hamlet, you know the song that uh, that um, Ophelia is playing on the violin, and uh, they end up singing "Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day." Sounds like a kind of a tender, um, uh, nostalgic kind of song, but by the end, she resings it, and we hear how um, dark and uh, tragic the whole thing is. Um, and we don't necessarily hear that tragedy early on. So to be able to find those touchstones for me throughout the course of the play is always a really great way to be able to build the rest of the, the shape of the sound. That, that moment with Polonius is not usually part of, of a production. We don't usually have Ophelia playing, playing the violin with her dad and him singing. That was an invention of this production. And Anthony, where, did that idea come from you or was it something that you and Stephen kind of hit on together or or what was the story behind that there were a series of uh, of uh, different um confluences that went into that so she has the song only in part two but we wondered about where it came from and where it might be rooted and um in looking at the part of polonius you know he's often a monster uh, or a, at least a ridiculous monster and yet when you look at what he does it's all based on love um love for his children trying to protect his daughter and um and so uh we had uh, between us, we came to the idea that, well, what if we get that song in, a, in an original form in part one, and then we can then do a variance of it in part two. There's just something Shakespeare does a lot in his plays. He'll set something up and then he'll change it. And, and, on, and then thrown into this mix as a ghost, right? So we, it's a ghost we, story. <laughs> so we need some sense of a supernatural quality here too, don't we? It gets, it can be haunting, it can be all sorts of things. And the instrumentation, especially the modern synthesizer, because as the play goes on, we move forward in time. So Stephen had tons of great solutions to all of that. The other thing about, about that too, is that working on this, on this production with um, Thomas Ryder Payne, the, the um, sound designer, who's also a composer, um, that was a, a whole different way of working again for me where I could, I could bring a musical idea and then he could treat that with reverb and effects and, and sounds and so on that they could kind of blend into this otherworldly thing, which in, in those ghost scenes, especially uh, was like a, a real collaboration between the two of us. And then as Anthony said, the, the, the production kind of moves through time, forward through time at a, at a kind of accelerated pace. So, uh, was that something that you had to take into consideration too? Absolutely. And I think that idea of that um, modern modernist period in the early 20th century, uh, part of the both the, the dread and horror and the excitement of it is about the rapidness of, of time's movement and... Um, the unpredictability and the the sense of chaos in the distance and uh, the idea of bringing in um, more modern sounds. So those those early synthesizer sounds or or, uh, you know, a classic example of those kinds of early synthesizers would be a, something like a Hammond organ, um, which, you know, we hear now is kind of you have to be very careful when you do that because it can evoke something specific. People might think it sounds like melodrama uh, of uh, you know of early um, early uh, sound picture, you know, uh, mo motion pictures and so on. So you have to be careful and create different kinds of soundscapes with those kinds of instruments that that couldn't have existed in um, in the, uh, the older generations era that it can only mean the future the the players you know the traveling 
troupe of actors who arrive in Elsinore and give rise to a whole lot of meta theatrical content in the play. Um, they they they've got their own kind of theme too. I mean, it's interesting. You you I, we talked about the theme assigned to Ophelia, but the the players kind of have their own little theme tune too, don't they? Sometimes I just can't get away from from writing klezmer <laughs> I just have, if i can put something that's kind of klezmer in there i will um but what i was thinking about with those players is that they it, to my mind and this is something we talked about with with anthony as well um that in a sense they represent what is happening elsewhere in europe you know that denmark is isolated and you know trying its hardest during the during world war one for example to be neutral um and we have the pogroms happening in Russia and Poland. We uh, with uh, with Ashkenazi Jews. We have uh, Roma people uh, moving and changing the culture of uh, cultures mixing, and uh, the fear that that brings up in the old guard. Um, and this so it brings a sense of like knowingness and also menace to the players as well as their own joy within their own group and their own excitement um, that I think helps to separate them from the rest of the rest of the society. We wanted the players to be vulnerable and, uh, and looking at that time, everything Stephen just talked about seemed like a very exciting possibility because, you know, in Shakespeare's time, during the times of plague, the players would sometimes go to the continent and travel along the Baltic and go up towards Elsinore. They think that's how they got to know it, that there was a, a place they would go to when the, when the plague was raging in London. And um, so this idea of these, these artists hanging on by their nails, that, that, you know, that they're being chased and abused and uh, they just start trying to survive as well as tell the truth and create a bit of beauty. And so, yeah, all of that seemed to be pregnant with possibility. Well, and that's what that's what I mean about the the, the sense of menace too. Is that art, um, no matter where it goes, has to challenge, and that makes people uncomfortable. But it can still, at the same time, when it through its its challenging, can show beauty and can teach and can enlighten and can expand the mind and the soul, heart and soul. But there's a sense of if you're not open to it it can scare the hell out of you. Do you find that the experience of writing for the theater has kind of added you, given you that, that artist's, that actor's ability to inhabit a, a, a psyche that is not your own? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, in writing, or, you know, we were talking earlier about my ability or lack thereof uh, to, <clears throat> to notate and, you know, read and write. Like that has sharpened significantly over the years because quite often in, in these in these plays, I'll have written a score that will include, let's say, a string section. So then I have to go and print this stuff out and then flap my arms in front of them in the studio while we're recording the, the track. It makes you get good pretty quickly if, you, if, you, if you're serious about it. And you know, now I've been able to uh, write full, full scores for um, uh, shows that I've been doing in, in my solo career with the symphony orchestra. Um, and so when you're writing for an orchestra, it's not that different from writing f uh, score for a play in the sense of, of course, an orchestral piece is running through the full length of the song, four and a half minutes or whatever else. But you learn. I've learned what works, what combinations of instruments work, how they support each other. You know, you can have one melody running somewhere, but without the support underneath it or counterpoint or those kinds of things and being able to really identify how to do that. Um, I think it makes, it makes my own work for my, for myself better and also makes me more excited to get back into the theater and write music for plays too. And, uh, the journey continues with Stephen, of course, cause he's been the composer of Here's What It Takes, which is a, a fantastic new musical that was to be presented in 2020 at the festival and will be presented at the festival. Um, and, uh, watching the evolution and the changes that Stephen's been making on that is really like, it's it's a whole other world, isn't it, Stephen? I mean, from just, you know, doing your own music, telling your own story to shaping it into a narrative. Right, well, writing, writing musical theater, I mean, I'm a huge fan of musical theater and I've always dreamed of writing a musical and 
thanks to your encouragement over the years, as you kept saying, when are you going to bring us a musical? Well, <laughs> I did. And here, here it, here it is. And you know, there, the songs started kind of as songs that I'm, I would sing, you know, they, I was trying to write from that perspective, but further, you know, tell a story over the course of those and, and shape characters. And then when those characters stop being you as the writer, it's a whole, it's a whole other skill set, And it's really quite amazing. Like writing for musical theater when you're in rehearsal one day and everybody decides, everybody on the creative team decides this character who has now grown into something different needs a song here to be able to say this and push this forward. And you have to go home and write a new one and bring it in and teach it the next day to the actors. Like that's a lot of pressure. Speaking of pressure, I'm going to be cruel. There's a guitar over there. Do you want to play No Song Left to Save Me? <laughs> sure. <laughs> you don't have to. Okay. Well, while Stephen's getting ready for that, uh, I'll ask you this, Anthony. When you have such a well-known composer writing for your for your show, is it a temptation to uh, give him his head and allow the musical sections to play for a bit longer? <laughs> Yes, yes, there are. I mean, the trouble with Hamlet is it's such a big text, but in um, As You Like It, and we, and he actually, uh, Stephen put out a CD of that. It, it, um, it, it just, it just, I had never wanted it to stop. It was so beautiful. So, oh, that's great. but here's what it takes is uh, it's ravishing. And this is what seminal song to this new musical. I'm not oh. used to playing on the guitar. Usually I play it on the piano. But... sweet ladies and gentlemen and thank you for watching goodbye thanks david bye stephen bye anthony great to see you and you thanks david bye, -bye. bye.